Welcome, everyone, to Lesson 7 of uh, the Project-Based Language Learning uh, Online Webinar Series. My name is Cherise Montgomery, and I will be your presenter today. We're going to be addressing three different topics, uh, content-based language instruction, um, scaffolding content, and scaffolding language and technology. Work here, we'll get started. There we go. Um, so, our objectives for today fall into three categories for this particular lesson. First of all, um, we want to make sure that we are defining content based instruction and that people understand what that is. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about how content based instruction and content. Uh, and language-integrated learning are useful in a project-based language learning context. And then we're going to look at strategies for using CDI and CLIL to plan meaningful project-based language learning. We're going to start by thinking about how we can plan a project that integrates language learning with content learning. So, one of the most interesting places to look is actually in the actual proficiency guidelines. And if we look at the superior level um, and sort of analyze what that level is asking students to do, we notice a couple of things. First of all, we notice that in order for students to achieve high levels of proficiency, they need to be able to discuss a variety of themes from a variety of disciplines using social and political, and to be able to discuss social and political issues, or in other words, current events. Um, we can see that in terms of text, students need opportunities to discuss formal and formal kinds of texts, and that they need to be able to discuss those texts from multiple perspectives. Students need to be able to narrate, give opinions, have hypotheses, or generate hypotheses, and uh, make arguments about the topics and texts that they're reading about and exploring. They need to be able to do this um, in, with regard to both concrete and abstract um, topics, and they need to be able to do this in extended, using extended discourse. These uh, proficiency guidelines give us some clues as to the kinds of things we need to think about when we plan our projects. First of all, one of the clear advantages of project-based language learning is, it, is that it gives students opportunities to begin to participate in all of these kinds of functions um, at a beginning level, uh, you know, from the point that they're beginning language learners all the way up until they develop this higher order proficiency. This also gives us a really good and clear picture of what we need to be integrating from the very, very beginning levels all the way up through proficiency so that we can um, help students to develop these skills. Three pieces are important here. The idea that we need to integrate content, academic content from other disciplines into the things that we are asking students to do in our classrooms if we hope for them to be able to eventually develop superior levels of proficiency. Second, uh, the fact that they have to be able to hypothesize and make arguments suggests that it's important for them to develop critical thinking skills. And finally, if we only give them watered down material, they're never going to be able to develop the complexity of communication that they need to be able to communicate at those levels. So the remainder of our time today will be spent looking at how we can take these ideas and apply them, particularly in beginning levels. So let's start with a, a bit of an exploration of what content-based instruction actually is. The idea of content-based instruction is that students use the target language in order to discover and explore the world around them in its most simple form. Um, it takes the perspective that we want the language to be the tool that students are using to engage in that exploration rather than the object of study. 
Content and language integrated learning offers a unique perspective on content-based instruction. Uh, particularly in Europe, a lot of teachers are exploring this approach, and one of the key tenets of the approach is that teachers expect that they are going to have to develop learners' language proficiency as they develop their content knowledge, or in other words, the idea that their language development and their content understanding go hand in hand and grow simultaneously. And if we think about the way that children develop, this isn't a strange concept. As children gain more and more experience with the, the world, their language progressively improves and increases as well. And parents seem to be naturally good at um, helping children to develop that language as they interact with them in the real world experiences. These ideas are very helpful in a project-based language learning context because they help us to start to see how we can take content that maybe students don't find particularly appetizing, such as grammar or vocabulary, and how by contextualizing it and integrating other 21st century skills into it, we can start to um, produce something that's actually worth eating uh, for students. And, and as we stimulate that appetite, they will become very motivated to develop their own language skills. This kind of an, a, a paradigm shift or approach to learning suggests a couple of changes. First of all, our definition of what we consider to be content changes when we're talking about project-based language learning. Instead of the language being the content, um, the content becomes conceptual ideas from other disciplines, such as music or social studies or science or art or business. Um, the idea that content is vocabulary or, or grammar shifts to those other disciplines. The role of content also changes because it becomes the thing that we are talking about. So instead of using vocabulary in the classroom where maybe we give students something to make with their vocabulary, project-based language learning actually engages students or looks for opportunities to engage students in using their vocabulary and their, their uh, language skills in the real world, in real world context. The roles of teachers and learners also change when we're thinking about project-based language learning and content-based approaches, um, but particularly within the context of project-based language learning. Students, instead of becoming receivers of information who sort of take um, orders from the teacher, become co-collaborators who discover and explore the world with the teacher. And in some cases, the students serve the role of expert when the project requires some sort of skill or knowledge that those students have developed that perhaps the teacher has not. And so I think one big shift that's difficult for teachers to make sometimes when they begin to experiment with project-based language learning is the idea that their job is not to provide all of the content or all of the skill, and that they don't have to be an expert in every aspect of the project that they want to do with students. Their job becomes one of coach and facilitator, where they use their own knowledge of the world, um, their life experience, and their skills as teachers, their, their pedagogical skills, to help students make connections to experts, to, to resources, and to, to content that can help them to complete the project. So students become doers and, and teachers become facilitators. And this is important even if you think about this in the context of learning to cook. Um, students are likely to make a lot of mistakes. For example, <clears throat> this photo happens to remind me of a personal experience where um, uh, one of my family members learned to make spaghetti for the first time. And not knowing any better and not having anyone around to coach her, she put the entire package of spaghetti into the water for a meal for two people. Um, this would be an example of a place where teachers can provide a little bit of guidance or, or support to students in advance that might help them to avoid some of those mistakes. But mistakes aren't fatal, and that's a key piece of, of project-based language learning as well, is that students are constantly fumbling and experimenting. Powerful projects have several key characteristics that uh, dovetail very nicely with some of the ideas behind content-based instruction. 
First of all, powerful projects engage students in exploring real-world issues for meaningful purposes. They do that in interactive, task-based ways that extend beyond the classroom and engage students with authentic audiences. It's important to keep these characteristics in mind as we start to evaluate the activities that we want to use as we're planning our project. Two last key ideas here before we shift over to the actual nitty-gritty of planning a project. The first is the idea that, like cooking, learning is inherently messy. It would be very unusual for us to walk into a kitchen and expect to make a Thanksgiving meal and not have some sort of mess. And although we may not appreciate the mess and we might be happy when it's cleaned up, we're not necessarily going to be angry or frustrated that things get messy in the process. And yet I think as teachers, we are very accustomed to seeing lesson plans that are very linear and put together for us in advance or that we put together and we expect our lessons to run accordingly. And so I think um, one really key idea to keep in mind as we're planning our, our projects for students is the idea that it's going to be messy. It doesn't start out as a linear process. That planning is going to be very iterative and cyclical. The plans are going to change as we get into the project and realize we've forgotten things or that a different order or a different focus might be better, and that's okay. Um, it's better to sort of think of ourselves as people who are going to wear aprons in the kitchen as opposed to someone who's going to wear a prom dress to, to make the Thanksgiving dinner. Um, so be comfortable with the mess. The second key thing to keep in mind as we begin planning our projects is that high-quality meals take time to prepare. I think a lot of teachers are very overwhelmed by all of the implications of project-based learning. For many of you even, the idea of 21st century skills and what those are and how you might integrate that into a curriculum that already feels very, very overwhelming and full of grammar and vocabulary and content and reading and writing and listening and speaking, and then you're supposed to develop cultural skills and not forget all of the standards, that can be exhausting to think about. And so one last piece of, of advice is perhaps as you think about um, preparing a meal, yes, it's possible to throw into the microwave a TV dinner, um, but you're going to get a better product if you're willing to invest some time. And once you've invested some time, what you find as a beginning cook is that you suddenly get very, very adept at not only the skills that you need to cook, it doesn't take as long to figure out what the recipe is asking you to do. It's not as difficult for you to try to um, organize things in your kitchen so that you can find them when you need them. You eventually get to the point where you can actually improvise, and if you don't have the right ingredient or the right tool, you can think of other ideas of ways that you can substitute for that. Uh, and I think the same thing is true as you begin to work with project-based language learning. There are lots of things related to preparing a project that feel messy and difficult. And a lot of teachers say, you know what, I just don't have that kind of, kind of time, and it's really not worth it. And there are certainly people who maybe eat out and, and have fast food every single day. Um, but I think for most of us, we eventually find that it is a little bit more satisfying to go ahead and learn how to cook and to maybe make some of those meals for ourselves along the way. And maybe initially, you know, we're going to be eating a lot of macaroni and cheese. And initially, it's okay if your projects aren't amazing, groundbreaking, global collaborations that change the world. But ultimately, I think anyone who spends very much time cooking gets to the point where they start to realize that they really enjoy the creative messiness of the process and that they really enjoy the deliciousness of the product and that even though it does take time and maybe sometimes we might be in a fast food mood and other times we may be in a cooking mood, over time, um, it becomes something that we integrate into our lives, hence the term foodie, I suppose. So, um, I really love this quote by Steve Jobs, um, and I think it's very applicable to teachers who are just getting started with project-based language learning. The idea that if what we do fills as much of a part of our lives as it does, 
why not go ahead and invest the time and the energy and the resources to learn to do it well? If we're spending eight hours a day in our classrooms every day, that's a significant portion of our day every week and a significant portion of our week. So with that philosophical uh, background in place, let's spend a few minutes talking about um, some concrete ways that you might shift from or, or take a topic and um, generate it so that or, or um, develop it so that it becomes a project. First thing to keep in mind is that there are three key components as we're planning a project. Uh, you can think of them as three courses in a meal. The first course <coughs> is that students need input. So once we've determined our sort of overarching topic and our driving question, which theoretically you all have done at this point, um, and we have determined sort of what kind of a project we think that we might like to engage students with, then our next step is to think about what kinds of input students might need in order to begin work on that project. Ideally, that input will come from culturally authentic texts. And ideally, those culturally authentic texts will have several characteristics which we'll talk about uh, in a future slide. The goal of the input is so that students can begin to develop background knowledge that they might need about the conceptual ideas related to the project uh, so that they can complete it successfully. They might need uh, background information about the context for the project. Um, for example, if students are working on something related to healthcare in another country, they may need a little bit of opportunity to explore what healthcare is like in that other country before they can feel any sense of meaningfulness or purpose in trying to address the issues or problems that you've identified for the project. Uh, culturally authentic texts also provide students with, ideally with multiple perspectives on the topic or issue that underlies your project. And again, we'll talk about that in just a few minutes uh, in more detail. The second phase or course of a project-based language learning meal is the idea of cognitive processing. Once students have had a chance to explore, let's say, the environment um, by reading texts that are pro-environmentalist kind of texts, texts that say, oh, there is no problem, or we really should be uh, focusing on developing the economy rather than concerns over the environment, or whatever the case might be. Um, and students have had the opportunity to, to engage with all different kinds of texts from different perspectives, uh, and both texts from perhaps the United States and from the country that you are targeting as part of your project, then students need opportunities to really process that text. And what we mean by process is to think about the meaning of that text on a, a number of different levels. The personal meaning for the student, what the text might mean for the community, how the text might fit in uh, from a cultural or social perspective, um, and, and the literal meaning of the text as well. So processing activities give students a chance to figure out what the text actually says, what the text actually means, and why that text matters to them. Processing uh, opportunities ideally will include some interpersonal communication, not just written uh, responses to questions, because we spend a lot of our time learning from other people. And if you buy the idea that cognition or learning or understanding is distributed among people and places and artifacts, then it makes a lot of sense that learning is a very social process. And so we want students to have opportunities to process or to think about those texts with other students. And those students could even be uh, located in a classroom in another country. The last phase of a PBLL meal is output. Students need opportunities to take all of these ideas that they've been exposed to and that they've thought about and that they have perhaps transformed or developed new ideas or new understandings in relation to their conversations with other students. They need opportunities to take that and share that with somebody else. And this is a place where their language um, can be used in, in a presentational sense. So how do we go about planning a project, or you might think of it as a meal, 
that is meaningful for our students. There are five key elements that have worked well for me and for my student teachers in the past. Uh, some of you who have seen me present before may recognize some of these elements from some of the work that I've done on thematic planning. Um, Project-based language learning and thematic planning go very much hand in hand, and a lot of the processes are very similar. So the first piece that we need to think about is our topic. And in the last um, presentation that I gave in lesson three, we spent some time talking about how you might take a straight vocabulary topic like clothing or school or um, food and transform it into something that's a little more conceptually meaningful, like fashion or education or nutrition. The second piece is that we want to take that topic and help students explore it through culturally authentic texts. Uh, this could also include realia. Texts could include things like advertisements, video clips, news broadcasts, uh, magazine articles, newspaper articles, poems, short stories, comic strips, anything that you can find that was written by native speakers for native speakers about the topic. The third step is to think in terms of tasks. And remember, the goal of these tasks is to help students to think about and process the meaning of the text, or in other words, to make sense and meaning from the text. Ideally, these, texts will, these tasks will engage students in higher order thinking and in interactive collaboration with one another. The fourth step is that we want to think about, okay, once we have identified our concepts and we found really good juicy texts for students to engage with, and we've given them interesting things to do with those texts, or that they're using those texts to accomplish some particular task in the real world, we want to help them talk about what it is that they're doing and to give up them opportunities to communicate. That talk can take two forms, interpersonal communication and presentational communication. One caution that I would um, share with you here is that a lot of project-based language learning teachers or even teachers who are thinking in terms of content-based instruction or thematic planning, have a tendency to make that talk very presentational because that is a very easy thing for us to sort of see the connection from the content to what they're presenting. I think it's a little bit tricky to start thinking about um, communication from an interpersonal perspective. And so project-based language learning teachers need to be especially concerned with looking for ways to generate interpersonal interaction among students during the entire course of the project. The last piece is tools. And by tools, I don't just mean technology. I mean the materials, scaffolding, um, et cetera, that students need, the supports that students need in order to complete the project. Um, we're going to spend just a few more minutes talking about each of these ideas separately. Because I'm your only presenter today, I'm going to play around a bit with the, the timing of our uh, webinar today. And I'm also going to give you a little bit of opportunity um, in the middle to be a little bit more interactive with one another. So keep um, generating your questions and thinking about those as we work through this process. Um, as far as topic goes then, when we think about topics, we want to make sure that the topic that we're using for our project is conceptually rich. And as we're thinking about how to engage students with that topic, we need to think about the contextual information, the background information, and the key disciplinary concepts or principles that learners are going to need in order to have success with the project. <laughs> so in other words, what I'm suggesting here is once you've kind of got a project in mind, you need to spend a few minutes analyzing kind of the conceptual content of that project and ask yourself, in order to plan the activities, what is it about this conceptual content that students might need to know before they ever get started on the activities? And what key disciplinary concepts or principles do you want the project to highlight or to help students really understand at a deep level? So our focus here becomes the academic content from that other discipline rather than language. And we will talk about where the language piece comes in in a little bit. 
when we start thinking about texts, it's important to think about lots of different types of texts. So you'll notice that on a, um, in a project that relates to clothing in some way, I'm pulling text from a wide variety of sources. I might take text from the textbook, such as this one. I may, might take texts that have uh, a classic element to them. Some, for example, um, El Delantal Blanco is a play that um, is very interesting that talks about the effects that occur when a Spanish-speaking maid and her um, the person that she works for end up switching clothes and how that affects their identity. I could take snippets of text from research articles. One of the things that I think teachers get hung up about is, oh my gosh, I have a level one student. They couldn't possibly read a research article in the target language. Um, and what I'm suggesting here is that we don't necessarily need for students to read the entire article, and we don't necessarily need to show students the entire video. When we're selecting text, we need to be looking for conceptual content. What is it that we identified in the previous slide about the topic or the project that we want students to think about? What are the cool or interesting or intriguing ideas? So the idea that clothing is something that we use or that, that through our clothing, our identities are constructed in some way. That clothing might relate, for example, to the cultural identity of a group of people, which is what this video is about. Um, it's, a, it's a group of young people who have made a public service announcement and are trying to recruit other people to the idea that it's important not to lose the cultural traditions and the identities that those produce uh, in clothing in their um, area in favor of strictly wearing strictly Western clothing. Um, I can have students explore the processes by which um, clothing is made in other countries or how clothing symbolizes different ideas for different people. And so by drawing on a wide variety of genres and texts and engaging students with those texts for different purposes, I can develop students' understanding of the conceptual content in powerful ways that give them really meaningful issues that they are motivated to talk about, that they want to explore, and that lend themselves to communication. We'll talk uh, a little later in the afternoon about how we can scaffold students' engagement with these texts, or in other words, how we can support them in reading texts that are that are technically too difficult for their level of proficiency. So as we think about um, this, just to kind of summarize, when I'm engaging texts, or when I'm selecting texts, I want to think about a couple of things. Number one, I want to use lots of different types of texts, because each of these types of texts have a different set of linguistic features that are going to contribute to the development of my student's proficiency. Um, so, for example, infographics usually are really nice texts for beginning language learners because they have lots of visual support. They still provide important academic content-related information, but they do so using very simple, limited language. Um, the next piece that we want to think about are different perspectives. And so I want texts that are going to show multiple sides of the issue. That makes the issue more interesting for students to explore. It gives them more content that they can actually discuss, and it positions them to think critically. It also pushes the pedagogy of the teacher. So most teachers have a tendency to um, engage students with a single text and ask or expect students to simply answer comprehension questions, for example. When we use multiple texts in conjunction with one another, it has a tendency to encourage us to start thinking about what those texts have in common, what those texts contribute that is unique, that some other text doesn't, and how all of those pieces put together increase our understanding of the topic. The same thing is true with different genres and media types. Some genres are easier for beginning language learners to work with than others because they have stronger schema for those genres, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes a little bit more. And then the last piece is that we always want to be looking for texts that give students the opportunity to look at the issue or topic or problem 
that we're engaging with in our project from the cultural perspective of um, the target culture. Okay, I think what I would like to do is pause here and take a few minutes um, to discuss your questions and things that you might um, be concerned about, and then we'll continue with the presentation. Um, so I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen for just a minute so that I can see the chat. Um, okay, uh, I have the first question for and you, Mike. If you all want to, uh, I'll let some of our moderators who have been following the chat um, offer some questions, uh, and we'll take a few minutes to answer those. Um, Sharif, can you hear me? Hello? Sharif, can you hear me? Let's see here. I see that Jim is speaking, but I am not able to hear you, Jim. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Hello, Sharif, can you hear me? My volume is all the way up and my speakers are on. Um, let's try There we go. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me now? I can. You can, okay. Um, let me try the The first question is, how do you check the difficulty level of the text you choose based on the proficiency level of the learners? That is a great question. <clears throat> um, and I guess I should start off by saying I don't consider myself an expert, despite the fact that we've sort of been framed as experts by being the, the presenters. Um, in my experience, it's not so much an issue of difficulty level of the text as it is of what it is that I ask students to do in terms of a task. Um, so I guess I am a proponent of the philosophy that it is useful to edit the task rather than the text. Um, so looking for what is it that I can realistically expect my learners to do given, um, you know, with a text. So, for example, a beginning learner can um, identify keywords in a text. A beginning learner can look for main ideas in a text, but they may not necessarily be able to extract all of the details unless I provide very careful step-by-step -step scaffolding that leads them through that process and guides their attention. Um, there are also online um, tools that will allow you to, to check sort of the readability level of particular texts. There are lots of measures for what constitutes a difficult versus less difficult text. Um, and so, for example, one of the sites is readability.info will do it in English. And it will, if you upload a link or a section of text, it will give you a list of um, parameters. What, you know, is this appropriate generally for students who have had 12 years of college is what kind of language does it use? Does it use a lot of passive voice? Um, what sorts of sentence constructions are a part of the text? Things along those lines. Um, I'm not aware of any that do that for, um, for uh, foreign languages, but there are tools like that that you can search for. Other questions? Okay, next question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, there was a question about um, maybe getting some more examples of actual PBL projects for beginner, beginning learners, the beginning level learners. Okay, I'll let the whole team speak to that one. Um, I think that's definitely something that we can do in the future. I did not come prepared to give specific examples um, of that today. I was more focused on the specific scaffolding pieces. Okay. Um, um, okay. Um, one uh, request for clarification, um, this is the comment. 
I'm not sure that infographic texts use simple language, maybe not for the beginning level students I'm thinking of, or maybe you meant stu students can uh, create infographic texts? Well, I think either one is possible, and I think it depends on which infographic you're selecting. Um, a little later in the presentation, we're going to talk about what are some of the things that make text difficult for learners to understand. Um, and I think one of the things that people sort of get confused about um, is that particular issue. So I think that oftentimes it's not so much the language or vocabulary that makes a text difficult for beginners to understand, it's their lack of background knowledge about the topic, um, which makes it difficult for them to engage in a lot of the reading strategies that effective readers use when they're confronted with text that is unfamiliar to them, such as, you know, guessing from contextual clues, things of that nature. If you have absolutely no background knowledge whatsoever of the topic, it's going to make that difficult to do. Um, and that's just one example. Uh, this is Stephen speaking. Uh, uh, aloha from Hawaii, everybody. I'd like to talk uh, to that question of beginning level language learners and project-based language learning. I think uh, a lot of people are very anxious that the input phase that Sharice has described will, since we're looking for documents that are by native speakers, for native speakers, we're going to see a lot of complex language and uh, scaffolding those for beginning learners will be difficult. I won't disagree with that, but I would like to offer the possibility that it is possible. So, uh, for example, let's think, uh, I teach Chinese at the beginning and intermediate levels, and the project that I'm trying to design uh, is uh, material that will be helpful for students from China who are coming to the U.S., so I'm looking at a lot of web documents that are written either by students from China who have studied overseas talking about their experiences or uh, that offer advice to other Chinese people about studying overseas. So uh, I, found, I found a bunch of different stuff. One, one good example is one page. It's not that long, but it's like 10 things that I learned uh, by studying abroad. So first of all, the, the very structure of the document itself helped me because it's 10 things. And so there are 10 little paragraphs. It's not uh, an integrated analytical article that's all one long uh, thing. Instead, it's bulleted. So the structure of the document itself helps me, helps bring it down towards the beginning level. So the structure of the document is one aspect. Then the next thing is I can use my students' pre-existing knowledge. When the students brainstorm about the things that might be difficult for foreign students in another country, they can usually come up with a lot of topic areas. And just by identifying a few key words in the document, they are able to match whether that document is talking about the things that they expected would be talked about. So once we reach that point where they have successfully identified some vocabulary in the document that proves to them that the things that they predicted are important, or at least maybe we identify some things that they didn't expect, then we're probably finished with that document. I'm not going to use that document in a very exhaustive way for them to find out every little detail that that person offered advice about on studying abroad. So I'm going to offer that one piece that you want to use a document not necessarily in the same way that the author meant for it to be used by the native audience. Instead, you're going to treat it maybe at a, a more superficial level or you're going to offer the students so much support by just asking them a few questions about the document that you'll be able to achieve your purpose quickly and then move on to some other document. Sharice, what would you say to that? I think that's exactly right. Um, and in my experience, that technique does work very well with beginning learners. Do we have any other questions? Uh, one, one more question. 
Um, would you use informal song lyrics and or cultural colloquial expressions for scaffolding before or after or together with formal texts? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I would be curious as to sort of the, the specific situation that maybe motivated that question, but I guess my own personal um, feeling on that is that it depends on your learners. Um, I think that some learners are very, very interested in the colloquial expressions. I think this, that some learners, it's all that they can do if you have really, um, if you have learners that are super easily stressed out and, you know, the personality of the class will differ from class to class, then it may depend. Um, I think one thing to kind of keep in mind is that each text can contribute something different. So maybe I'm going to use informal, you know, maybe use song lyrics that have a lot of informal expressions to sort of provide some of the social language related to um, whatever it is that the topic is that we're discussing. Whereas maybe I'm going to use a more academically oriented text in order for to help students or support students in extracting some of the academic language that they might need in order to discuss the text. So I think you can use different texts for different kinds of purposes. Um, and just because a text was originally intended for a specific purpose, uh, like Stephen mentioned, I, I don't think that that necessarily means that we as teachers have to use it for that purpose. Um, we can you know, use it for our own designs. Thank you.